Do you like epic games, games that tell a story? Do you look for these unique PlayStations that you remember for 20 years? Hello fellow gamers, I'm Jean-Michel Grosjeu and you're watching my series of videos where I tackle the rules of heavy games. And not only the rules, also some few basic strategies to help you feel comfortable at the game table. So here we go, it's time to overcome my delicious French accent and take a seat together in front of that heavy game box. Welcome my friends, I'm Jean-Michel Grosjeu. Hello my friends and welcome to Jean-Michel Grosjeu's workshop where I will teach you the rules of another heavy game, another game that tells stories and I should say another masterpiece of gaming history. Gunslinger, a game from 1982 by Richard Hamblen, the same designer who created Magic Realm, no need to say that I owe eternal gratitude to this man and I'll never thank him enough for the whole imaginary dimension he planted in my mind. Fine, and so what is this game about? Easy, look at its gorgeous box illustration. Gunslinger is a game about the old wide west, a game that recreates some famous historical showdowns like the gunfight at OK Coral in Tombstone or when Billy the Kid escaped out of his jail in 1881. Gunslinger is a game full of history but also of good old Wild West fantasy. The goal of this game is to immerse you into another era in the boots of a sheriff, a saloon keeper or a desperado. Gunslinger is a very tactical game where one counter is one single man or woman, like here where a gunfight breaks out in a saloon. Gunslinger gives a very detailed simulation of the fight where one game turn represents a real duration of two seconds. That means that a full two or three hour game session can simulate a showdown lasting only 30 or 40 seconds. At the end of this first video, I'll show you a short example of the beginning of a gun duel. It will help you to feel the flow of the game and to understand what the decision space for a 19th century gunfighter can be. Ok, now to begin with, let's see in a nutshell how this simulation works. And first thing first, let's keep it simple. Two men face to face, each player plays a single man. In this game, every character gets a full hand of 12 cards that represents all the actions he can do. 12 actions? No, 24, because each card is double-sided. And if you already know or own this game, perhaps you don't recognize its cards. That's because the cards I use here are a customized personal version that I find easier to read and to use. These cards can be downloaded for free from the Gunslinger Board Game Geeks webpage and I'll be using them throughout my videos. So, both players have exactly the same 12 double-sided cards. They both can do exactly the same 24 actions. This is the beginning of a game turn, a two second long turn. And first, both players simultaneously must decide what their character will do during the following turn, the following two seconds. Time is suspended and they both choose action cards from their deck. A two second game turn is divided into five segments. If you do the math, that means that a segment lasts four tenths of a second. And each action card has its own duration in its top right corner, a big red number. And so, very easy, each player can choose for his character a number of cards whose total duration doesn't exceed 5. This choice is secret, each player hides his selection under a card that bears his character's symbol. Let's say that orange gunfighter symbol is the big red dot, and the player has chosen three actions whose total duration is 3 plus 1 plus 1 equals 5. Perfect, but shh, this is secret, of course. 
Fine, now that both players have chosen actions for their character, step 2, these actions are resolved segment after segment from segment 1 to 5. And so, before all, both players reveal their top action, the action card just under their symbol card. The first player, let's say here it is the square player, has chosen to shoot. The dot player has chosen to back up, that means to walk backwards. And as they reveal their actions, they must announce exactly what they will do. Each scenario gives a player order. Let's say here that it is square player, then dot player. So square player must choose and announce now what he will do with his shoot card. As you see, there are three options written on the card. He can do nothing, or shoot, or fanfire. But for now, we will forget this last possibility. Let's say he can shoot or cancel and do nothing. He chooses to fire at him. He puts a cube on his card to show his choice. Then, dot player must do the same. With his backup action, he has three choices. His character can move to three possible adjacent hexagons. Look, if he want to go there in hexagon F6, he must choose this movement. He puts his cube to show his choice. And note that to this point, nothing happened. Both players in player order have announced their intentions, but they have not yet done anything. And after that, players can resolve actions for the first segment. In our example, both players did declare their next action, but square player's action's duration, shoot, is 1 while dot player's action duration, backup, is 3. That means that square player shoots during segment number 1, while dot player must wait until segment 3 to actually back up. In this first segment, only square player resolves his action. He announced that he shoots dot player's character, so he must shoot. We will see how to resolve a gunshot later, for now, we just want to understand the structure of a game turn. As soon as square player has completed his action, he must reveal the next one. This is an advance action. He must decide now what advance his character will do. He shows his choice with his wooden cube. His character will advance ahead right toward hexagon F3. But not yet, because his first action lasted one segment, and this advance lasts two segments. He will resolve his movement at segment number 1 plus 2 equals 3. So, segment 2, nothing happens. Segment 3, both characters have an action to perform. When there is such a tie, we use the default character order. In our example, this is square first dot second. Square characters move first, he advances to the right. Then, dot character backs up to his left. And both characters reveal their next action and declare exactly what they will do. In player's order, square character will run to the right, and dot player decides not to turn at all because the turn card he has chosen allows him not to turn. Okay, you get the idea, segment number 4, square character runs to the right and dot character does nothing. And they both reveal their last card, square character will turn to his left and dot player will shoot. Segment number 5, dot player shoots because whatever player order, shoot actions always take priority over others. Bang! And let's suppose that square character is hit in the head and dies instantly. End of the showdown. And this is not a joke. Gunslinger is a realistic simulation and in real life, if you are hit in the head, you die. Gunslinger can be a very short game. And that's it, you've got the heart of Gunslinger, its game sequence. And it's very important that you deeply understand it. All your actions are selected beforehand, at the beginning of the turn. After that, in only two seconds, it's too fast to change your plans. You must do exactly what you've decided. And then, during the turn, players follow a two-beat rhythm. First, you reveal your next action and announce exactly what you are going to do, where you are going to move or who your target is. And second, when the time comes, 
you resolve exactly what you've announced and immediately you reveal your next action. Fine, now all we have to do is to look at the 24 player actions one by one and we'll have the whole game figured out. First, please note that all players have the same deck of 12 cards, that is 24 actions. And because what your character does during his turn is a selection from these cards, that means, for example, that a character cannot do the advance action twice in a turn, just because there is only one advance card. But there are two sprint cards, so he can sprint twice during a turn. And note also that because cards are double-sided, if, for example, a character chooses to advance during his turn, he cannot back up during that same turn, just because advance and backup are the two actions on both sides of the same card. If you choose one, you cannot choose the other. Okay, now let's see a first batch of actions, movements. A character on the map is on an hexagon and he is always facing toward an adjacent hexagon and this is shown by an arrow on his token. And so, a character has always one of six possible facings. And if I say that, that's because it's important to understand that when a character advances or runs or sprints, he doesn't change his facing. He always looks toward the same direction. Let's take the advance action. It allows to move in one of the three hexagons to the front. If, when you reveal this card, you choose the front left hexagon, for example, two segments later, your character will move to this hexagon, but while keeping his facing. And this is the advance action, moving one hexagon in one of the three hexagons in front of you and without changing your facing. The run action is quite the same, exactly the same movement, faster because it lasts only one segment, but it has a prerequisite. In order to run, a character must advance during the same turn. So, for example, here, blue character's deck is correct. This character can advance one hexagon on segment 2, then run to another hexagon on segment 3. Red character's deck is also correct. The run action can be revealed before the advance action. As long as both actions are part of the deck, it's ok. And finally, orange player's deck is not correct because he planned a run action without advance on the same turn. The run action is cancelled, but still it costs one segment. And the next action will happen on segment number 3, 1 plus 2. Note that this run action is cancelled because it is incorrect. But in the two other decks, because they are correct, the run action cannot be cancelled and must be executed. You cannot cancel a correct action. The sprint action comes in two cards, so you can do it twice a turn. It is far simpler than an advance or a run. If you plan a sprint, you have no choice but to move your character in the hexagon straight in front of him. And you can plan a sprint action only if you have planned a run action in the same turn. If you remember that to plan a run action you also need an advance action, that means that you need the three actions in the same deck. The three actions use 2 plus 1 plus 1 equals 4 segments. So you can still add the second sprint action to perform the longest possible movement in a turn for hexagons. Note that the order of the cards doesn't matter. If there is an advance action in the deck, you can play a run, and if there is a run, you can play a sprint. Beware, this deck, for example, is not correct, because even if there is an advance card, you know from the beginning that this card is not legal because the total number of required segments is greater than 5. The advance card is incorrect, so the run card is incorrect too, and both sprint cards are also incorrect. If a player actually plants this deck, he just shoots on segment 3 and that's all. And I'm sure that you have noticed that there is a second prerequisite on the sprint card. 
In order to play a sprint card in your deck for the turn, you must also have played a run card in the previous turn. You need momentum. So, here is the exact sequence you must follow. First turn, you can play advance and run, but you cannot play any sprint card. Then, next turn, because you've played a run card in the previous turn, you can play both your sprint cards for a total of two hexagons on the first turn, then four hexagons on the next turn and all turns after this one. If you stop running, of course, you must restart the sequence from the beginning. Fine, now instead of advancing, you can choose the other side of the card and back up. Backup is slower and costs three segments. With the backup action, your character moves into one of the three hexagons behind him. Here, red character chooses to move back left. Note that he doesn't change his facing. Backup is the only existing backward movement, and because it's on the other side of the advance card, you cannot both advance and backup in the same turn. And because you cannot play run if you don't play advance, and sprint if you don't play run, that means that you cannot move backwards and forwards during the same turn at all. Turn is a quick move by which you rotate once without leaving your hexagon. Once to the left or once to the right. With this card, you can even decide not to rotate at all. Here, for example, the character decides to rotate to the right. And a little slower, you can also spin around. This is the same as the turn action, but toward one of the three hexagons behind your character. Note that in this case, you cannot do nothing and keep your facing. And that's it. Here are the six basic actions you'll use to move your character. Perhaps did you notice on the sprint card the sentence draw one delay card? That's because sprinting is exhausting. If your character sprints, he will probably be out of breath and after that, he will have difficulties aiming or shooting at his targets. Every time your character resolves a sprint card, entering the X in front of him, he draws a result card. There is a deck of 108 such cards and this is how you resolve random issues in Gunslinger. As soon as your character has finished resolving his sprint card, you draw a result card. This card shows a lot of results, text and numbers, but because you were told to draw a delay card, you only look at the delay line. In this example, the result is two delay points. Your character gets a two delay points counter. And that means that from now on, he must add 2 to his segment total, that is, to the cumulative duration of his actions. Let's suppose his action deck for the turn was this one. For a total of 5 segments, no problem. Red character begins to resolve with segment number 1. He announced he turned to the left, he turns to the left. Segment 2, he sprints. No choice, he moves into the hexagon just in front of him. And he must draw a delay card. On the results card's delay line, he gets two delay points. He puts the delay counter on his action card's deck. And now look, delay points add to the segment number. 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 2. That means that the next advance action would occur on segment number 6. Last segment in the turn being number 5, this advance action will never occur. For dot player, the turn is over, the planned advance and run actions are cancelled. There are 6 possible delay card results. From 0 to 2 delay points, in our example with 2 delay points, dot player was quite unlucky. There are also 3 special results. Wild shot, the character accidentally fires his gun, drop, he falls to the ground, or he loses his aiming. Note that in the three cases, he gets no direct delay points. All these special results will be explained later in this video. Fine, so delay points are a time penalty that your character can get when he sprints. This time penalty is added to this character's next action segment number, 
but of course, with time, he recovers and at the end of every turn, each character's delay points are halved. If the number is odd, it is rounded down in favor of the character. A character with one delay point ends up with zero. And now let's add a new dimension to the fight. You can move to the front, to the rear, you can move to the left or to the right, but you can also move up and down. Usually your token on the map represents your standing character, his upright. If you play the get up down movement card, after three segments, he gets down in the dirt. As you see, when he lies down, the character's token is just flipped to show his downside. And okay, I agree, even if I'm a big fan of this game and its 80s graphic style, we can say that it's not easy to see that our character is down. Just some faint white letters, but that's the way it is, that's how you see that a character is down. And what does it change? Why should I order my character to get down? Mainly to take cover. As we will see very soon, even in the open, a character can be a little bit more difficult to hit when down. But it's even more true on maps where there is cover, like here where the character hides behind a headstone. Note also on this example that hexagons can get some weird non-hexagonal shapes, but we will see that later in the next video when we'll talk about terrains and cover. Fine, there is no do nothing option on the action card, so when you reveal it, it's too late to change your mind. If your character is upright, he gets down, and if he's down, he gets upright. No choice. There is another action card that does the same, leap drop. But it is a lot faster, lasting only one segment. The drawback is that you need to draw two delay cards, two result cards where you read the delay lines. And it can give your character some delay points, that is, the time measured in segments that your character has lost when trying to jump to the floor. And what are the odds? When I draw a delay card, what are the chances I get zero or two delay points? This is very important to know beforehand what risk you take. Thanks to Jean-Michel Grosjeu, who counted all the 108 cards for you, here are the odds. And because the special results White Shot, Lose Aim and Drop correspond to a delay of zero, this gives a 50% chance to get no delay at all. Now, once your character is down, he can still move, he can crawl on the ground, but this is not so easy. A down character can turn and spin around exactly as if he were standing upright. No difference, same card, same duration. But if he wants to actually move into a new hexagon while down, with the actions advance, run, sprint or backup, he gets two delay points. No need to draw any delay cards, he gets his two delay points counter and that's all. Ok, ok, all this is fine and not so difficult to understand. But you and me don't play Gunslinger to move our characters around. What we want is to shoot our guns to kill the wanted Desperados or the annoying Sheriff. And as you already know from our very first example, there is an action for that, the shoot action. Shooting in itself is very fast, only one segment. And when you reveal this action card, you can choose to do nothing. You can cancel your fire. Or you name your target and you shoot. There is a third option, fan fire, but more on that later. And so first, keep in mind that you can always cancel a shoot order. And here is a good advice. If you don't know what to do, you can always put the shoot action card in your deck to be able to shoot if by chance a fire opportunity appears during the turn. Fine, let's say you want to shoot. And of course, in order to shoot, you must have a gun. Every character in the game has his own personal sheet. Here is the character sheet you can find in the original game. It's a little bit dull, but it's handy and we will use it as it is. Our character has a name, Innocente. 
and he gets a symbol, let's say the square. Each turn, when the player selects his actions for the turn, he keeps the cards hidden under his own symbol card with the same square. And then, Innocente has four boxes that are his inventory, his holster, his gun hand, and his other hand. Note that we don't bother with right-handed or left-handed fighters. There's only the hand you use to hold your gun and the other hand. And finally, there is a box for the weapons your character holds in both hands, if, for example, he wants to fire like this. Each weapon is represented by a token. Here is a Colt 44. Our character, Innocente, is holding his Colt 44 in both hands, like on the picture. But he could also hold it in his gun hand. A character can shoot a one-handed gun with one or both hands. We will see later that some skilled characters can fire guns with their other hand, but usually the best place for a one-handed gun is the gun hand box. A character can also use a two-handed gun, like this Winchester, but only with the weapon in his both hands box. There are other prerequisites, but for now we keep it simple. You want to shoot, you have a gun, and when you reveal your shoot card, you must designate your character's target. Of course, your character must see his target. In game terms, his target must be in his aim zone. Every character can see in the three hexagons right in front of him and all hexagons behind following the rows. This is what is called his aim zone. And this is still true if he is down. The aim zone stays the same. We should add the character's hexagon itself because, as we will see later, two characters can be in the same hexagon and, in such a situation, they can fire at each other. Now, back to our example. I just revealed the shoot card for my character Innocente. He has his Colt 44 in his gun hand and he can shoot, so he must name his target. Fast Eddie, the orange character, is in his aim zone, so that's okay, he declares Fast Eddie as his target. Segment number one, it's time to resolve the shoot action. Easy, I just draw a result card and read the result on the main table. The distance to my target, counted in hexagons, is 3. I look in the second column and the aim time is printed on the shoot card I played. For a one-handed gun, it's one, first line on the table. And the result is a stroke, and that means a miss. And that's it, Innocente did fire with his Colt 44 to Fast Eddie, and he missed. Fast Eddie just heard the bullet whistle and nothing more. You've got the basics. You shoot, you draw one result card and you check the result depending on the range to your target and your aim time. The same shot with another result card would have caused a leg wound or a critical wound. For a lot of other result cards, the couple range 3 and aim time 1 is not even in the table and in this case, of course, it's a miss. Note that the result cards deck is just a way to resolve random events. There is no die roll in Gunslinger, and the deck is reshuffled each time you need it. There is no such mechanism as counting cards or checking the discard pile. Here are all the possible results for a gunshot. This gives, in fact, where the target has been hit. And you guess that the ensuing wound can be more or less severe. It's not the same to be shot at some vital organ or in the head or the leg. BE means bullseye, the fire hits exactly where he was aiming. In game terms, the player chooses any location from the above list. That being said, I keep this panel for later because before learning the awful wounds a gunshot can do, we must first go back to the shoot action and understand how to maximize our chances to hit. Innocente missed a fast Eddie because he was shooting at a range of 3 with an aim time of 1. He could have shot fast Eddie in the head by being two hexagons closer, that is, adjacent to him. 
And we know how to do that because we know all the movement-related actions. But there is a second way for Innocente to hit Fast Eddie in the head, and that is by increasing his aim time. How can you do that? All we know about aiming for now is that there is an aim time on the shoot action card. It is 1 for a one-handed gun and 0 for a two-handed gun. And that means that you will never do any harm with a two-handed gun because aim time 0 is never to be found on any result card. So, to achieve any success, you need to spend time aiming at your target. The action card you need for this is Cock Aim Shoot. When you reveal this card, you can choose between four options. First, you can just shoot, like with the previous shoot card. This one is a little bit slower because it takes two segments, but it gives a slightly better aim time, two for a one-handed gun and one for a two-handed gun. Okay, but with this card, you can instead just aim at your target without firing. When I reveal this cock aim shoot card for my character Innocente, I must announce his target. That will be Fast Eddie. He must be in Innocente's aim zone, of course. And then after two segments, Innocente just puts one of his aim counters on Fast Eddie. Each character has special aim counters with his own symbol. And we said previously that Innocente's symbol is the square. And now, I'm sure you understand, it's very easy. When Innocente plays a shoot card, he shoots with an aim time of 1, the basic aim time written on the shoot card, plus 2 for his aim counter equals 3. If we remember his previous result card, an aim time of 3 would still not be enough. But with two cock aim shoot cards in his hand, and even by cumulating aim points from turn to turn, our character can increase his aiming to maximize his chances of killing Fast Eddie with his next shot. Fine, now there are some rules to know about aiming. First, a character cannot cumulate more than 8 aim points on his target. And thus, after adding the basic aim time on the shoot card, that can give a total of 9 or even 10. And all of your aim points are lost as soon as you shoot, of course. You must restart cumulating aim points each time you fire your gun. But also, you lose all your aim points as soon as you reveal any action other than aiming. Think about that. That means that while you are aiming at your target, you cannot move at all. You cannot lie down. In fact, you can, but you lose all your aim points. If you play a shoot card, but you decide to do nothing, of course you don't lose your aim points. And if you play a turn action that keeps your target inside your aim zone, you don't lose your aim points either. So, Innocente is aiming at Fast Eddie. Now, let's suppose that another character, the Mountain Man, is also threatening Innocente. When Innocente reveals his next action card, this is a cock aim shoot card. He chooses to aim and increase again his aim points, but each time a character chooses the aim action, he can change his target for another close target. And so Innocente can slide his aim counter to the mountain man. Now, as you guess, if you do that, you will lose some aim points because you are not so steady anymore. The rule is, you lose two aim points for each hexagon you move your aim counter. So, let's do the math for this example. Innocente has four aim points. He gains two aim points for the aim action, but he moves his aim counter one hexagon to the adjacent mountain man. So, minus two aim points, and the result finally is four aim points on the mountain man. Note that this rule comes from a supplement published in the General Magazine volume 19, but I think you need it to make the game much more realistic. Beware, moving your aim counter is only possible when you reveal your action card, not when you resolve it. So, the exact sequence in our example is the following. Let's say it's segment number one. I reveal Innocente's first action card, Cock Aim Shoot. 
I immediately choose aim and I declare that I change my target to the mountain man. The aim counter is moved one hexagon and loses two aim points. Then, during segment two resolution step, the aim action is resolved and my character gains two aim points. Okay, and you can do the same with the shoot action. Just as you reveal your shoot action, either on a shoot card or as part of a cock aim shoot card, you can move your aim counter following the same rules. Note that when your character aims at a target character, his aim points are attached to this target character. So, if now the mountain man moves, Inocente's aim points follow him without decreasing. The aim point loss is just when you change your target. An aim counter can move with this target without decreasing. But this is true, of course, only because the mountain man stays inside Inocente's aim zone. If he moves again and leaves this zone, all aim points are lost. No character can aim at a target outside his aim zone. And all this leads to a final refinement about aiming. You can aim at a hexagon. Not a character, but a hexagon on the map. In this situation, the mountain man is robbing the bank. But while he is in front of the vault, stealing money bags, Inocente can aim at the hexagon just in front of the door, up to the maximum of 8 aim points. And it will be very difficult for the mountain man to leave the bank alive, because as soon as he enters this hexagon, Inocente can, with a shoot action, transfer his aiming from the hexagon to the mountain man character. And because this can be done without moving the aim counter out of his hexagon, no aim point is lost and Inocente can fire with all 8 aim points. No need to say that without a huge amount of luck, the mountain man will not survive. The rules are the same whether you aim at a character or a hexagon. With the aim or a shoot action, you can move your aim counter from one hexagon to another, losing two aim points per hexagon. And finally, note that you can aim at your own hexagon because you can need to shoot at a character in your own hexagon. But you cannot move your aim counter from your hexagon to another, neither from another hexagon to your own. Ok, there is a final choice on the cock aim shoot action card. You can cock or uncock your gun. Of course, because in order to fire your gun, it must be cocked. At the beginning of the game, usually, but it can depend on the scenario, all characters' guns are uncocked on their sheets, gun tokens are flipped. Inocente has a colt in his hand, but it is not cocked. With the cock aim shoot action card, choosing the cock action, after two segments, he just flips his weapon to its cocked side face up. Like for the shoot action, in order to be cocked, a two handed gun must be in the both hands box, and a one handed gun must be either in the gun box or the both hands box. Of course, as soon as a gun fires, it becomes uncocked and must be cocked before shooting again. As you know, there are two cock aim shoot cards with a duration of two segments each. But there is also a slower draw and cock card with a duration of three. You cannot aim, you cannot shoot with this card, except fanfire but more on that in the next video. And it is a little slower because in addition to cock your gun, you can also move it on your character sheet. Inocente has a colt but uncocked and holstered in his belt. With the draw and cock action card, he can first move it to any box on his sheet, so in his gun hand for example, and then he can cock it. But of course all this happens only after 3 segments. With this same action card, a character can pick up an item, especially a gun, from his own hexagon to any box on his sheet. And that's how a character can pick up an item lying on the floor or from a table, for example. And always, he can cock the gun he moved. Of course, this must be the same gun. You cannot pick up a gun with your other hand and cock another gun with your gun hand. No. Note 
that with the draw and cock action, a character can pick up an item from another character in the same hexagon, provided this character agrees, or if he is dead, or if he has passed out. And that's how two characters from the same team can exchange items from their inventory. Some item manipulations are so easy, they are free. The first one is to move an item from your both hands box to any one hand box. That just means you held the item in both your hands and you just release one of your hands. This is free and doesn't require a draw and cock action. For free, you can also just drop an item from any hand box to the hexagon the character is in. And you can do that every time you reveal an action. It's instantaneous when you reveal any action, not when you resolve it. And finally, note that a character can have only one gun in each hand or one gun in both hands. He can have, for example, a two-handed rifle in his other hand box and fire a one-handed Colt in his gun hand. Of course, if he wants to fire with his rifle, he must holster his gun because he needs both hands. And this costs two draw action. Note that he can drop his Colt in his hexagon to do the same with only one draw action. And finally, note that a character's holster can hold four one-handed weapons, a character can have a spare gun or a knife in his holster, but not a rifle. Okay, so when you fire your gun, as we already know, you lose your aim points and your gun becomes uncocked. Fine, but there's another thing. Obviously, when you fire your gun, you spend a bullet. You spend one ammunition. Every gun begins with its magazine full of ammunition. For a Colt 44, for example, that gives six bullets. Then, each time it shoots, it loses one bullet. And when there is no bullet anymore, it cannot shoot anymore. Of course, there is a load action, the one you need to reload your gun. It lasts three segments, and as you see, it's a very simple action. You just need both your hands to put new cartridges in the magazine, so your gun must be in the both hands box. Here, for example, you need first a draw and cock action, then you can load. Not the same turn, unfortunately, because you would need six segments. Okay, your gun is in your both hands box. For one load action, you put one new cartridge in your gun. You recover one ammunition circle and only one. Reloading your gun leaves it automatically uncocked. And that's all. Easy to understand, but rather cumbersome to carry out. You'd better count your shots and think twice before shooting your last bullet. Knowing when to shoot is one of the most important choices you'll have to make during a game of Gunslinger. But what are the chances of hitting your target? What probabilities are hidden inside the result card deck? Here is a table that can help you. Whenever you fire, you have a 7% chance to misfire. And this is independent of range or aim time. 7% whatever you do. And after that, this table shows your chance of hitting relative to range and aim time. The small numbers in red are the chances of a bullseye. That is pretty much your chances of killing your target right away. Keep this table handy at all times. You'll need it to decide if you must aim a little longer or move toward your target or whatever plan you'll need to survive the showdown. And now that you know how to aim and how to shoot at your target, Perhaps is it time to see the whole picture from the other side. Innocente just fired at Fast Eddie, and now Fast Eddie is hit. You remember this panel, it gives all the locations on the target body that can be hit by a gunshot. During a segment, all shots are simultaneous. Players resolve first all shoot actions, then all other actions, movement, aim, load, and so on. And only at the end of the segment, the effects of shots are applied to their targets. 
Fine, so Fast Eddie was just hit by a gunshot. The injuries he suffers depend not only on where he was hit, but also on the weapon used by his opponent. There is a special table in the game, the Impact Table, which gives the damages depending on the weapon and the wound location. Innocente shot his Colt 44 from a range of 2 hexes with an aim time of 2. He hits Fast Eddie's leg. Colt 44, leg, here are the consequences of the shot. And that's how you use this table, very simple. And now you must apply these results to the poor Fast Eddie. Let's see now, one by one, all the results you can get from this table. And first, the easy one, kill. The character is dead, his token stays down on the map, and this character doesn't play anymore. Then, three results affect your overall health. Light wound, stun, and serious wound. First, with an example, if a character gets a light 3 wound, he draws three result cards and he checks the delay line and adds up the three cards. This gives the number of delay points he gets. These points will be added to his next action's duration. And this gives also the number of endurance points he loses. Every standard character has 20 endurance points. If he loses all 20, he's dead. Ok, stun is quite the same result, but more severe. Stun 3 means you draw 3 result cards, but this time, instead of the delay line, you look at the wound line where numbers are higher. Also, as soon as you get a stun result, you lose all aim points. Now, serious wounds. This result has no immediate effect in itself, but you note on your character sheet the number of serious wounds, and at the start of each subsequent turn, your character gets a light wound result of this value. In this example, the character would get an automatic light 3 result at the beginning of each turn. Beware, the beginning of each turn is more precisely here, just after you've selected actions for your character. That means that when you choose these actions, you don't know yet what delay points you will get for this turn. Also, at the very end of the game, if your seriously wounded character is still alive, you must check if he dies eventually from his wounds. We will see exactly how it works in the next video when we will talk about victory conditions. The next wounds are the ones that create some kind of disabilities. Gun hand. The character must drop what he holds in his gun hand. His gun hand weapon drops to the hexagon the character is in on the map board. In our example, he holds a two-handed weapon in his both hands box, so he releases his gun hand and his weapon ends up in his other hand, and he loses any aim point, of course. If he was aiming with this Winchester, all his aim points are lost. But this works even for a one-handed gun in his other hand box. If his gun arm is wounded, the wound is noted on the character's sheet. Note that the text on the sheet is gun hand wound, but it should be gun arm wound. Hand wounds don't have to be noted on the sheet. And from this point on, every time the character will shoot with his gun hand or both hands, he will get this aim point penalty. And this is the same for other hand or other arm wounds. The same, but on the other side. A leg wound is noted on the character's sheet. In this example, for a leg 4 wound, he writes a 4 on his sheet. And he will incur a light 4 wound every time he will enter a new hexagon on the map. So, he will draw 4 result cards for the delay and will lose the given number of endurance points. But only if he stands upright. If he stays down, he can move, he can crawl, without incurring any further loss. And finally, the last group of effects are not really wounds, but just the shock of being shot. Stagger. Fast Eddie gets a stagger result, so he immediately draws two result cards. The first one, you read the X line, 
gives the direction of this one hexagon involuntary movement. Here, fast AD moves one hexagon to his front left, the direction is relative to the characters facing. And the second one, X line again, gives the direction he will be facing to. Back left, fast AD involuntary rotates like this. Sometimes the X line gives the direction long. This means the first hexagon away from the shooter. If, for example, in Oshente the shooter was here, we draw an imaginary line to get the first hexagon away from the shooter. If Inoshente is here instead, there are two hexagons right behind Fast Eddy. So in this case, Fast Eddy, the character who is staggering, can choose one of the two. And finally, last step for the stagger result, the character gets an additional drop result. What is a drop result? Mainly, it means the character falls to the ground. He becomes down and he draws three result cards, always three, and adds up the delay points from the delay lines. Only delay points, no endurance loss. Note that a character who gets a stagger result with a wounded leg doesn't get extra damages for staggering. Staggering doesn't count as regular movement. Note also that if a character is already down when shot, he stays where he is and doesn't stagger at all. A down player cannot drop either. A drop result can occur after a shot, but it can also just appear when you draw a result card to check for delay. The effects are the same. And this brings me to two other effects that can only happen when checking for delay or wounds. Lose aim and wild shot. Lose aim, nothing special to say. Your character loses any aim points he has. The other one is wild shot. Every cocked gun the character has on his sheet fires. It becomes uncocked and loses one ammunition. This wild shot cannot harm anyone. The shot is just lost. And note that it is also what happens every time a cocked gun is dropped to the ground. You remember that a character can freely drop his weapon from his hand to his hexagon on the map board whenever he reveals a new action. So, if he drops a cocked gun, this gun automatically fires like with a wild shot result. It becomes uncocked and loses one ammunition without harming anyone. And that's it. That's how you determine the consequences of a shot. Beware, Gunslinger is a very deadly game. A game in which you cannot take two bullets and keep on running. And as you understand, your character is much more likely to die from a headshot than to slowly lose endurance points until they reach zero. That being said, it is still possible. If his endurance score falls to zero, a character is dead. But also, if he has more delay points than endurance at the end of two consecutive turns, he passes out. He drops down and cannot do any action anymore, but he is not dead. As we will see in the next video, it makes a difference when deciding victory at the end of the showdown. Note that passing out is checked at the end of every turn. That means after dividing delay points by two. So you really need a lot of delay points to pass out. And note finally that you cannot shoot at a passed out character. It's a matter of honor. Even the worst gangsters don't do that. Now just two little topics before closing this video. First, when you shoot and draw your result card, you can get a malfunction card. The effects of this card depends on the type of ammunition you use. We will see in more details all existing guns and ammunition in the next video. And for now, let's keep it simple. Usually, characters use unloaded ammunition. So, with this card, for example, the result is no effect. No effect means that you draw another card to replace this one and go on with the resolution of your shot. If the malfunction is a misfire, the shot misses. The gun loses one ammunition, all aim points and gets uncocked 
and the player must draw another card to see if the gun itself is damaged by the misfiring ammunition. If the second card is a regular card, nothing more happens. The shot misfired and that's all. But if it's again a malfunction card, you apply the second draw effect. In this example, the gun jams, it loses all its ammunition and cannot fire again until it has been fully reloaded. The gun can also explode and be removed from play if you are very unlucky. And finally, let's have a look at some last elements that can change the result of a gunshot. Perhaps did you notice these lines on some result cards? They mean that the result of the shot can depend on the target status. Here, if the target is down, all critical results are ignored. And this is why it can be a good idea to drop to the ground in front of an enemy firing at you. Down targets are more difficult to hit. The same for heads. Heads are special counters that simulate a target leaning out of a window or half hidden behind a trough with only the upper part of its body visible. More on that in the next video. Two other target status are possible. Move. This applies if the target did or just revealed any movement during this turn. Movements are advance, backup, run or sprint. Turn and spin around are not enough to give the movement status. And so moving can also be a good idea to avoid being shot. Note that in this example, on the first segment, square player reveals that he shoots while dot player reveals a backup movement. So, if square player draws this result card for his shot, the movement target status applies to dot player even if it would have actually moved only on segment 3. Just because he has revealed his backup action is enough to get the movement status. And the last possible target status is run. This one applies only if the target performed or just revealed that same turn a run or a sprint action. And all these target statuses can alter the hit probabilities we already saw. In fact, it's not easy to turn all these into symbol probabilities. All I can do for you is to compute the chances of reducing or even cancelling the hit thanks to a special target status. In the case of the run target status, there are two additional probabilities because a character who runs also take advantage of the move target status. Keep in mind that running or dropping to the ground can be a good way to survive a shot. And that's it for this first video about the rules of Gunslinger. And as promised, I will close it with a gunfight example so you can understand how all these rules fit together during an actual game situation. Innocente, Fast Eddie, you know the gunfighters. They meet at the Coral, vengeful and ready to battle. They both have a Colt 44 on their belts, with six cartridges in the magazine. They don't need anything else, so go and let the bad one bite the dust. Turn 1. They begin by choosing simultaneously and secretly their actions for the five segments of the turn. Then, they reveal their first action, and regardless of the duration of each action, they must announce their choices in player order. The player order is given by the scenario, let's say here it's Innocente first, then Fast Eddie. Innocente announces he will draw and cock his Colt 44, Fast Eddie will advance ahead right. Segment number one, nothing. Segment number two, Fast Eddie advances, then he reveals his next action, he will draw and cock his Colt 44. Segment number three, Innocente draws and cocks his gun, and he reveals his next action, cock aim shoot, he just aims at his opponent. Segment four, nothing. Segment five, both have planned an action, so they play in play order. Innocente adds two aim points on Fast Eddie, and Fast Eddie draws and cocks his Colt. End of the first turn. Next, turn 2. Innocente, first player, reveals a cock aim shoot action and announces he keeps on aiming at Fast Eddie. 
Fast Eddie reveals an advance action. He declares he will move straight ahead. Segment 1, nothing happens. Segment 2, Inocente gains two aim points and Fast Eddie moves one hexagon ahead. Then, Inocente reveals another cock aim shoot. He chooses aim again and Fast Eddie reveals a cock aim shoot action also. And it's some kind of a surprise. He declares he will aim at Inocente. Inocente is confident. He is four points ahead. Segment 3, nothing. Segment 4, Inocente gains two aim points again and two aim points for Fast Eddie also. Now, Inocente reveals a shoot action. Because the shoot action lasts only one segment, it is very common to end your turn with it. There is a do nothing option on it, so you can always add this action at the bottom of your deck and decide at the beginning of segment 5 whether you shoot or not. And with 6 aim points, Inocente would have liked to wait for 2 more points, up to the maximum of 8. But he thinks that the probability is very high that Fast Eddie reveals a shoot action also. Inocente doesn't want to be hit by the first shot when he's being aiming at his opponent for more than a turn, so he declares he will actually shoot at Fast Eddie. And it was a trap. Fast Eddie reveals a run action. He faked aiming at Inocente to trigger his shot and runs to increase his chances of being missed. As soon as he reveals this action, he loses all his aim points. Segment 5, Inocente shoots. Range is 5, aim time is 1 on the card, plus 6 for the aim counter equals 7. Inocente draws a result card, it's a vital result, and a vital result always means an instant death. But Fast Eddie is running, and the vital result becomes a missed result. End of the shot, Fast Eddie just heard the bullet whistle past his ears, Inocente loses his aiming, he loses one ammunition, and his gun is now uncocked. And now, Fast Eddie run one hexagon ahead. Ok, I stop this example here as you understand how the situations completely changed. Now Fast Eddie is just 4 X's away from Inocente, and Inocente will need 2 segments with a cock aim shoot action to cock his gun and be ready to shoot again, so Fast Eddie can aim one more time and get 2 more aim points than Inocente. Now both players will probably increase their aim points, and the question is, who will shoot first? And that's the fun of Gunslinger, and that's not the half of it. In the next video, I'll be introducing a whole host of further refinements, scenarios, special weapons, terrain and obstacles, brawling, and much more. So, take a little rest and meet me again very soon. Salut les amis, et à bientôt chez Jean-Michel Grosjeu.